Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how's it going today? It is going so fantastic today, Tim. Once again, we have another amazing guest on the show that we're privileged to speak with. Tim, I'm going on and on. How are you? Sir, I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. And I'm excited to speak with our guest today, Charlie of Crime Lines. However, Tim, before we get to that, as you know, we're going to have to break real quick for a couple of sponsor ads. And if you're out there listening and you don't want to hear these ads, feel free to subscribe right through your Apple podcast app for $4.99 a month. You will get every episode of Crawl Space ad free. We've also bundled that with our missing podcast. You get every episode of missing as well ad free plus Plus, our weekly bonus show, which is fantastic and fiery. And if you're not an Apple user, we have an answer for you there as well. You can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm. Same deal, all that same content, $4.99 a month. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be right back. And now, Charlie from Crime Lines. Charlie, how's it going today? Good. How are you? Doing pretty good over here. Before we begin, anyone who's not watching this video cannot see how wonderfully Charlie's red lipstick is popping right now. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a look. It's my video look. And I appreciate you bringing it to the table. So, uh, Charlie, tell us about you and your show. What is your background? And, uh, and tell us about Crime Lines. So Crime Lines is a true crime podcast. It's a mix of the words crime and timeline. So we walk through the cases as they unfolded rather than structuring on them in a sensational way. We get the backstory so that we know what we're walking into when the crime does occur. It's general true crime. I cover all sorts of cases. My background is not in audio or true crime or journalism. I trained as a sign language interpreter, which is absolutely useless in an all audio format <laughs> that I'm currently working in. So it's quite the shift for me. Wow, that's amazing. Do you still do any work in that? No, I, I mean, I sign with my deaf friends. Well, like one. <laughs> but other than that, I haven't used it in a while. I've always been envious of people who master that skill. Well done on that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I had learned it at a period of time in my early 20s because my godson is deaf and I just hadn't used it in so long. I I've completely lost it. You lose it fast. I bumped into my friend in the neighborhood and she started just signing full speed at me. And I was like, whoa, 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 no, no, no. We're awful now. We're awful. We can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> My godson has some hearing aids now, so mm -hmm. he doesn't sign as much anyway. You didn't just abandon him. <laughs> 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 How do you sign awful? Because you said you had to tell them that you're awful. It's just like your middle finger and your thumb, and it's like you're flicking something away. You're like, oh my, that's awful. very appropriate. One of the things with sign language that I really like is that it's meant to be a visual language for communication. So the signs have a basis in a visual aspect that makes it easier for to remember them so like if you want to say you forgot something um, there's two signs for it but one very common one is the sign for empty but you put it across your forehead so you're saying like my brain is empty i don't remember the sign for help evolved you know it's you put your hand i'm like showing you signs on a podcast but it evolved from helping someone across the street by grabbing their arm and it just kind of shortened so it's it's a fascinating language it is fascinating so Tell us about your podcast. What kind of crimes do you cover on your show? For Crime Lines, I will cover pretty much any story, but the first question I ask myself is, why am I telling this story? What am I bringing to it? What can the audience learn from it, gain from it, whether it's about how our legal system works or about a social issue? I did one time use my sign language background. I covered a case where the defendant was deaf, and she asked for certain accommodations in the courtroom. And so I was able to explain why those accommodations were wanted and why it would be limiting her access to the legal system if she didn't get them. Things like having a deaf interpreter, which is using a relay system. Most people don't understand that. I picked that case because I could bring that to the table. I don't want to cover a case just because I'm like, oh, look at this kooky, crazy story, because these are, I mean, people's traumas. So there has to be a reason why I cover the case. I pass on some when I don't think there's anything I can add to what's already out there or... 
there's not a reason to tell it other than it's an interesting story. It used to be enough for me in my podcast life, and currently it is not enough. What an interesting way to button up that answer. So it used to be enough. Currently, it's not enough. Was there a moment there that you made that shift and had that realization? It was very gradual as I would cover a story and I'd be like, oh my gosh, you guys, this is so interesting. And then it was just listening to, you know, victims, victim advocates, becoming friends with people in the true crime space and hearing and just listening without getting defensive their view of true crime and their view of how their loved one's story has been covered in the past and things like that. And so that kind of brought me to a place where I was like, okay, why am I even doing this at all to start with? And why am I telling these stories? Stories. It really kind of gradually evolved over time. All right. Well, tell us about this first case of Danny and Ray Green. It's a complicated family case. And as you know, we know a lot of cases start that way. And it is a case where the kind of the hook of the case that you'll hear a lot is that the police came out to the property and asked Danny Green, where's your husband? And she said, oh, he's on the road. And they say, well, you know, his truck's right there. How's he on the road? And she says, you can search the property if you want. And they get over to a toolbox and it's got flies buzzing around. And she says, oh, I mean, you can search the property, but just not that box. So, you know, of course, that's the police are like, well, now the only thing we want to search is that box. And in that box was Ray Green's body. The thing that was really interesting that drew me into this case was that in Danny's defense, she claimed kind of a combination of self-defense and battered woman syndrome. However, when you look at the history of their relationship, it looks like the one exercising control and possible abuse was actually Danny. That's an interesting dynamic within a relationship that doesn't get explored enough, the position of the man being the victim of abuse, but then also for her to then take it to court and try to twist it to make her the abused one and how that works and how we can't always take everything at face value and that we need to look at the entire picture. So that was the thing that drew me into covering this case. I want I wanted to be able to give a bigger picture of what happened versus just she killed her husband and stuffed him into a box. There was a lot more here. And so Danny claimed that she was being abused. Do you think she was being abused by Ray? I don't think so. There was one witness who said, I saw bruises on Danny and she didn't have a good explanation for them. She was also an Olympic hopeful in equestrian writing and performing. And so she worked with horses a lot. When you work with horses, you get bruised. She worked with them daily. So I, you know, I don't know how much stock I put into that when you say she didn't have a good excuse to have a bruise. Well, she was working with horses. That's a pretty good reason. No one else really saw anything. There is evidence that she was cutting him off from his family, blocking his daughter's number on the cell phone they shared, things like that. And the story she told. So she combined battered woman syndrome with self-defense. And she had to do this for one reason. Her story was that she got up, used the bathroom in the morning, and Ray got out of bed and started threatening her and started about to attack her. She grabbed a loaded gun and shot him. She then left the room. She reloaded and she went back in and he was still alive and she shot him dead. Because she left the room, it's no longer self-defense. If you can leave, it's not justified to shoot somebody. So because she left the room, reloaded and went back in, she had to then say the battered woman syndrome is the reason why she felt she wasn't safe even if she left the room. So she kind of did a combination thing. However, the evidence showed that it looks more like he was probably shot while he was lying down because at least initially because the bullets went through a blanket and a top sheet. So was he attacking her with blankets and a top sheet wrapped around him or was he lying down probably sleeping? The evidence definitely leans that way. So I don't believe her that she was being abused throughout the relationship, though that's just a personal opinion relationships can become uh, mutually combative. And I can't say that that didn't happen at all. But as far as what happened the day she shot him, her story doesn't line up with the evidence at all. Am I correct in saying 
that she shot him 10 times? Yeah, she went, she had to reload. So she shot him mostly in the torso and the chest, and then she came back and shot him in the head. What kind of gun was this? Was it a 38? It was like a revolver, so it had six bullets in it. So she, yes, she almost, she almost cleared that twice on him. Yeah, right. Basically, she emptied it. She went, she reloaded, and then she almost emptied it again. And then she got to a very messy cleanup. And wasn't there a story where she initially said that he was killed by the German Shepherd dog? That is a bizarre factor of this case. So if you want to say she shot him while he was sleeping, she had absolutely no plan for after that because she calls his mother, who lives in another state, and says... Ray's dead, our dog mauled him and ripped his throat out. And that's when the mother called the police, and that's why the police went out to the property. And she said, oh, no, that didn't happen. Well, why did you say it happened? And a very odd thing is the dog has never been found. So they believe that perhaps she was going to try to sell that story, but she had to get rid of the dog because then they could check teeth marks and does the dog have blood or whatever. I don't know what she thought, but the dog has never been found. Now, what did Danny say about putting Ray inside the box? She said she dragged him out into the box. She did not have a good explanation for why, if this was self-defense, she didn't call 911 and say, my husband just attacked me and I shot him. She has no explanation for that. She just decided to try to get away with it. So she moved him into this big toolbox put his body in there, and then it was right up against the house. And she didn't want a dead body right up against her house, so she went and got a tractor, and she pulled it away from the house. So not only is she telling the police, don't look in the in this toolbox as flies buzzing around, it's just off in the middle of the backyard, you know, on their property. So it definitely looked suspicious. She also had cut up evidence from their bedroom, like the carpet, and put that in there. And so she put all the evidence in there with him. So this is what I mean by she didn't have a plan. She had absolutely no plan to get away with it. And she called her mother-in-law and then she called his work and said he was dead, but had a weird story the first time and a different story the second time. And I don't know if it's a case of she had a plan, but then when she actually killed somebody, she snapped, you know, she spiraled and then that explains her erratic behavior afterwards, or if she really killed him spur the moment for some reason. I don't know. But the evidence is that he was lying down when he was initially shot. So I don't know what could have come before that. And what about Ray's background? Yeah. So Ray was quite a bit older than Danny. He ran a horse farm in Texas where she would have her horses initially trained And he was married and he had a daughter who was an adult when his wife died. Um, I don't know if you have any Oklahoma listeners, but, you know, the I-40 bridge collapse, the bridge was hit by a barge and it just crumbled into the water. And there was no way as you were coming up on it to notice that the bridge was not connected. So people were literally driving off the bridge until they could get people to stop. And unfortunately, Ray's first wife died in that. And pretty much right away, he's getting this big settlement from insurance and from the company, and he's inheriting her half of their very lucrative farm. Suddenly, Danny's spending all her free time. She's married at this point, but starts spending all her free time up at the farm. And so she really started dating Ray when he was in a very vulnerable state, very vulnerable. Wow, how tragic. Yeah, I just feel like this case, it it seems clear from the forensic evidence and really the circumstantial evidence that she murdered him in cold blood, but I can't help being just disturbed by her defense, like how close that could have come to her actually getting off. And it's really one of those things that we see happen in court where the defense has to have a defense. And part of that defense is to besmirch the name of the victim. And in cases where it's unlikely to be true, you know, adding insult to injury to the surviving family and the memory that they're hearing this story in court that Ray was abusive physically, emotionally, and sexually, that he was attacking her that day, all these things that are unlikely to be true. And now they're like court record. They're in all the newspapers. They're in, I don't know, 48 hours dateline, whoever covers this. Everyone's talking about this, including me. For that to just be out there is very, very difficult on families when things like that get out where they're not even true. And it's hard when they are true. You know, you don't want your loved one's, you know, backstory to necessarily completely be out there. People deserve privacy. So that's 
one of the things I'm sure you're familiar with as you're looking into, especially missing persons cases, you don't know what's relevant. So you tend to bring in a lot of things and sometimes people don't want everything out there. Sometimes they, it needs to be out there for our, our greater purpose. And it's a balance that most podcasters have to deal with. You know, it's crazy to me is probably Danny seemed like a sane individual before she was convicted of murder. I think like the three of us on this interview are all pretty sane individuals. And if we knew somebody who suddenly inherited a ton of money because of a tragedy, I don't think any one of us here and probably any one of us in our immediate circles would consider infiltrating that person's life and waiting for a moment to assassinate them and then create a story about abuse just to get money. And I wonder if people, and I want to get your opinion on this, I wonder if people who do this ever look at the history of this and say, this hardly ever works out. Maybe because they do it well and they don't get caught, but usually they get caught. Usually this isn't a perfect murder. Usually when people see that you, this person, this victim has inherited a lot of money and then out of nowhere, this new relationship happens and this murder happens, I mean, they're going to you first. And you're probably going to get caught. What's your opinion on that? It's always odd to me when someone thinks they're going to get away with killing their spouse because you're going to be the first suspect. And people do get away with it. People go to trial or, and are acquitted or it turns out it wasn't them. But you are going to be the first suspect. And that's one of the things with this is just that she had no plan of how to get away with it afterwards when she should have known she was going to be the first suspect. I think in Danny's case, she was her whole life very ambitious. And I think she has a mind that thinks that everything's going to work out for her. I think that is her. I'm not that person. I assume every if I get on a roller coaster, that's the roller coaster that's going to fall off the tracks. Like if I <laughs> if I'm the one scuba diving, I'm the one who's going to have a hole in the line. Like that is me. So I would never I don't understand this kind of I don't want to call it confidence, but this just kind of a surety that the universe is always going to work in your favor. And I think that is Specifically in this case, I think that's what Danny believed, that everything always worked out for her and this would not be any different. But sometimes there's a fine line between optimism and stupidity. And I feel like Danny definitely crossed that line with her internet searches. Yes, <laughs> she did leave quite the internet search history. I think that was a major, major part in her conviction was if you're looking up, you know, how long someone can die after being shot in the head, that's not going to look good when someone close to you is found shot in the head. Th that she didn't know to delete her browser history, you know, it's again overconfidence maybe. She just thought it was going to work out. They weren't going to suspect her they would buy her story. And I think a lot of the unraveling is because she unraveled after she shot him and didn't go through with her plan to get away with it. I don't even know what to make of that. How long would someone survive after being shot in the head? Why do you even have to Google that? Unless you're making a podcast, you don't need to Google a lot of the things <laughs> yeah. that that we see come up on people's internet searches right before they go ahead and kill somebody. Yeah. I mean, you're either making a podcast or you're killing somebody. Those are the only reasons you have those searches. Exactly. And maybe I watch too many movies, but most people die pretty quickly after being shot in the head, unless it's like in a part of their head that clearly doesn't have any organs that keep you alive. One of the ways she phrased the search was so casual. It's like, will you survive or is it lights out immediately or something like that? She used the term lights out. And I was like, what an odd casual way to look up what's going to happen when you eventually shoot your husband so that you can run off with some other guy. Like the casual language, I think, startled me with that because it does seem like, I mean, just no care at all, not even care to phrase it appropriately. And then her extreme sudden interest in Gabby Giffords and how she survived her head wound. I mean, there is just a lot there that I think, I think the, the state had a pretty solid case I mean, self-defense is hard to prove. Battered spouse syndrome is hard to prove. So, I mean, I'm not surprised at the verdict at all. And the verdict was pretty aggressive, right? They did deliberate for several hours, which I, I personally like to see. When a jury comes back really quickly, I'm like, how, you know, if you were sitting there for weeks and weeks, how did you really discuss things and be sure and weren't just going off your knee-jerk reaction if you're only back there for like two hours? They did deliberate for several hours, which I always feel good about that a jury really paid attention. And then she was found guilty of everything. Uh, she did get almost the maximum sentence for what it was. So she'll be 
Nick in her 70s before she's eligible for parole. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. What about this next case that you've covered, the murder of F.C. Martinez? So to back up, my first Crime Lines episode was in 2019, and I covered a murdered Indigenous woman from Canada. Then I covered a few that year, and then in 2020, I started making a concerted effort to make sure I was covering these cases regularly. At the time, in 2020, the MMIW, which I think everybody knows the acronym now, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, very few people were covering it very regularly. So I started covering pretty much Indigenous women and girls, and now I've kind of expanded that to cover any case that I think needs more attention. And in the case of F.C. Martinez, this is a case of intersectionality because not only was he Diné, which is to say Navajo, he was also what's called Notle, which is a traditional Navajo gender. In the traditions of Navajo, there are four genders, and he identified as Notle, which is born male, but living in the roles of a woman is the easiest way to explain it, though it's not. That kind of sounds like, oh, well, it means transgender, but that's not it's not on the binary. So it means, you know, maybe we'd say non-binary, but it's very specific. And it extended within the culture, not just to men who dressed as women. It also extended to men who were gay. And it is just the blending of sexuality and gender is different than what we generally discuss. It was a Difficult one to cover in that sense because I'm trying to explain a cultural thing that is with outside of my culture. So I did have someone explain it to me, which helped, you know, and make sure that I was covering it properly. Any Navajo word I say, I'm probably saying it wrong, doing my best here. And FC Martinez, he was. 16, living in Cortez, Colorado, which is a pretty small town. Though being a small town and a rather conservative town, they actually have a very vibrant LGBTQ community. And this was a situation where he was attacked and left in a canyon for dead by someone who later bragged, without using the slurs he used, that he had beat up a gay person. And then when he found out that that person had actually died, he then bragged that he had killed him. Because of the bragging, someone called Crime Stoppers, thankfully, and provided a tip that led right to his door. So it feels like it's pretty obviously a hate crime. But Colorado at the time did not recognize gender expression, identity, or sexuality as a hate crime. It was pretty much just race and religion at that point. So it would not be tried as a hate crime He also denied it was a hate crime, claiming that his mom was a lesbian, so how could he be homophobic? He said his mom sometimes dated indigenous women, therefore how could he be anti-indigenous, anti-Navajo? He had a lot of stories. The goal with this case, he was going away. The state had a solid case, so this was a case that was going to plead out. Like, he was not going to go to trial. And in the process of pleading out, they did have representatives from GLAAD who came and wanted to make sure that he would go away for long enough that FC's mother would never have to walk down the street and bump into him. That was their goal. So he pleads out. They sentence him to 40 years. And they thought, okay, 40 years. That's perfect. She'll be like 90 by the time the guy gets out. He was released a couple years ago. She is alive and well. He was paroled Because it wasn't a hate crime, there was no sentencing enhancement. There was absolutely nothing to stop this man who, he beat a 16-year-old to death with a 25-pound rock. And he bragged about it. And he served about 17 years. And I know in the true crime space, we hear about really long sentences. Some sentences, I think, are absolutely excessive. Is this a person that really needs to be locked up for the rest of his life? But in this case, just 17 years, which is less than half of his sentence, he served for an extremely violent crime. He had a history of violence, even though he was like 18 himself at the time. He did have a history of violence. He had been kicked out of pretty much every school he had gone to starting in middle school. This was a kid who needed help and didn't get it. Um, And now he's 
walking the streets. The outcome of this case is very upsetting. There is a fantastic documentary, if anyone wants to look at it, called Two Spirits that covers this case, covers the not lay, covers what that means, what it means to other people. They interview a bunch of people. It's a phenomenal documentary if anyone wants to watch it. And that's how I first heard about the case was watching the documentary. You said that he was out walking the streets as a, as a free person. Is he in the same area as the mom? No. Currently, he lives... So this is Cortez, which is really um, close to New Mexico border, which is actually he lived in New Mexico. This guy was only in Cortez for the weekend. He was uh, selling meth at a rodeo, but he was only in town even for a weekend and bumped into this guy he never saw before and murdered him. So he was released. He has to stay in Colorado and he lives he lives north of Denver, like Greeley, I think. But yeah, I mean, he lives several hours away, about as far away in Colorado as you can get. And hopefully... He stays there. Like, he just stays away from Cortez. He does have family there, so I just hope they just, out of respect for FC's family, his brothers, and his mother, they just stay out of Cortez. I I mean, I hope he does. Is this guy able to stay out of trouble, do you think? I'd be surprised in the sense that... Most people go into prison with already a violent background, aren't necessarily getting the help they need to not be violent in the future. However, we do have reports like through the FBI and other places that investigate crime that male aggression crime kind of peaks in their 20s and then goes downhill as the theory is as testosterone declines. So that's why um, serial killers like BTK and Golden State Killer, why they stopped as they got older. They stopped having that same drive as their testosterone declined. That's a working theory that I've spoken with. I don't know if you know Peter Vronsky. He's kind of a serial killer journalist, author, expert guy. I mean, just because he is older, he's, you know, in his mid-30s, I would hope that he could. I don't know what kind of help he got in prison, but it sounds like he has a history of behavioral issues as a child that then culminated in him murdering someone at 18 and then 17 years in prison. I don't know that he necessarily came out a more gentle person, so I would be concerned personally for public safety. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Is there anything that you know about Fred Martinez Jr.'s personal life, like his family life and how his family, friends, I guess, reacted to him coming out as, is it two-spirited or two-spirit? He did use two-spirit as well as not lay. I won't get into the whole history. I cover it kind of in my episode about what two-spirit means. But yeah, when he was about 12 or 13, he sat his family down. He is one of several, he was born one of several boys in the family. I think there's like five of them. And he is either the youngest or was like one of the youngest. And he sat them down and he said, this is how it's going to be. This is who I am. And he would sometimes wear makeup, but also while wearing baggy clothes, you know, wasn't. And sometimes he would present more masculine, sometimes more feminine. And he really embodied that sense of not one or the other, rather not lay or two spirit, that both spirits were within him. And he felt very connected to his culture when his mother talked to him about when he came out, she's like, well, you know, we have a word for that in Navajo. And they talked about it. But one of his brothers, one of his older brothers warned him just to be careful. And so when he went to school, he he did experience bullying from some other kids. He had a core group of friends who, I mean, solid, solid friends, which is very, very important. But I think the biggest problem wasn't the reaction of other children, but of the reaction of the administration. One story that's pretty commonly told and I covered in my episode is he went to school wearing those jelly shoes and very common for usually girls. And he went to school in them and they told him they called his mom and said, you have to bring him some new shoes. He's not allowed to wear these at school. You know, if you have kids, you know, they can't have open toe shoes. They can't have flip flops. They can't have this because it's a safety thing. So she assumed, oh, this must be one of those safety shoe issues. So she didn't think much of it till she was up at the school later and noticed there was a girl wearing them. And so she asked, I thought you said these weren't in dress code. And that's when she found out that they weren't in dress code for FC because he was born a boy. It was commonly things like that where he would get dress coded. It was usually dress code. They would use dress code as a reason to pull him aside and say, you can't dress like that. You can't do that. 
while girls were allowed to. So it's something that still happens today in schools. And a lot of times it'll come to a head and then the school board has to bring in an expert to train. I have a friend who does this. She goes into schools and trains teachers and guidance counselors and principals on issues of the LGBTQ community and how it manifests in I mean, I want to say children, but we're generally talking people who are 12 to 18. So, you know, teens and adolescents and inform them you're being the bully when you're saying you can't wear these shoes because they're too girly. What does that even mean? Shoes like I tell my kids, I'm like, shoes don't have gender. Colors don't have gender. FC couldn't wear shoes because they were too girly. I wore them when I was a kid and I had blisters from them and still wore them. I mean, when they're When it's the popular thing, you want to wear it, right? And that's all FC wanted to do was, you know, be who he was. And that was a problem for people. So there were a lot of things like that. He did end up dropping out of high school and taking the adult ed classes to get his GEDs. And that's where he was taking those classes at the time of his death. Like I said, so Cortez has a strong LGBTQ community. And in this process, they learned that within themselves, they had to make sure they were being more open and intersectional and realizing that when you're a middle-aged white man with a professional job, even if you're gay, you may be treated differently than a gay teenager who lives in a trailer park with his single mom and four brothers. Like that there is a difference in how people were being treated and just because you have one experience doesn't negate the experience of someone else. So there was a lot of growth in the community and in Colorado in the aftermath of this and hate crime bills in Colorado. Many of them were voted down, but a few years after this, they finally included um, sexual orientation in their hate crime bill. So this may have been tried as a hate crime, which is to say there would have been a sentencing enhancement. I mean, I just can't get over. What what did he spend, about 16 years in prison? It was less than half his sentence. And less than the life of FC. Yeah, so FC Martinez was on this earth about the same amount of time as Killer spent behind bars for taking his life. What the hell? That's infuriating. You know, like I said before, I always pick what what do I want to talk about in this case? Why am I covering this? And a lot of times with the indigenous cases that I cover, I do history, tribal history, because I didn't learn it in school. And I don't want my episode to just be the trauma of a member of that tribe. I want to talk about what that tribe's about. Where are they from? When did they get moved? What kind of treaties did they have? A lot of times those episodes are kind of like loaded with history first, and then you get the case. This case, of course, I wanted to discuss the traditional beliefs on gender, but the other thing I really wanted people to think about when they heard this case was about, you know, our sentencing and about what does it mean for something to be a hate crime. Like when you hear, well, isn't every murder born out of hate? And it's true, but that's hate of one person. A hate crime is hate of a community. And so your crime has wider reaching effects when you are targeting people because of what they believe in or what color their skin is, you are sending a message to that entire community that they are in danger. And that is why it gets a sentencing enhancement. It's not because FC Martinez was a more worthy victim than any other 16-year-old. It's that this person, Sean Murphy, put fear into the community, not just one person. He didn't target FC. He targeted the gay community in Cortez. But, you know, because of the way the laws were at the time, he spent not very much time in prison. It's really unfortunate because looking into, I'm sorry, is it pronounced Nadlahi? Not lay. It's kind of got a glottal stop in there. But yeah, not lay, you can say. It's like a beautiful thing. Like as I was looking into that, I realized that this is considered a beautiful thing. Like you have the opportunity and, and a gift to see through the eyes of two genders. And that is like completely the opposite of how we take it. Like that type of identification. Just tragic that this person who is selling meth at a rodeo took that away. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really um, important to also understand about the Natle is that within the traditional culture, they had a very important role. The Natle were regularly the ones who would raise children whose parents died. You know, I mean, we're talking before penicillin. A lot of people, you know, and as, and we, of course, know with the indigenous history, but even pre-contact between injuries that can't be treated and disease, there were children who were orphaned. And the Natle were regularly the ones who would raise those children. There was a very important 
role within the community, a role that I don't think is necessarily unneeded anymore. It's just that colonization and then basically the suppression of religion within the Navajo culture means now they're more on the the gender binary. But it is. It's a beautiful thing. And it was because FC Martinez was so out and loud and proud, not just being gay or non-binary, but very specifically Dene, very specifically Navajo. What an amazing example that could be. You know, what he could have done with that on a larger on a larger platform. And now it's being done in the wake of his murder instead. And that's that's horribly tragic. Yeah, it really is. That's sad. Charlie, what is coming up next for you? Oh, ugh, lots of things. <laughs> for the show, I have a really interesting case coming up where a woman claims she killed a man who intruded in her house and like a decade later was arrested for his premeditated murder. She has people in her family who stand by her and people who don't. But You know, the other thing I'm doing a lot of is traveling for live shows and meetups and events. I'm going to be in CrimeCon UK for the first year. I'm excited for that. So, yeah, just keeping busy. And have you, since you started Crime Lines, felt like the true crime podcasting community has been a welcoming community for the most part? Yeah, I started in true crime podcasting in, was it 2016? I had a show called Insight. We actually met at a crime con back when that was still the show I was making. And I felt it was really welcoming then. I feel like it still is now. It's a little different because there's a lot more. There's a lot more of us. It was easier when we went to crime con, we all just kind of knew each other. Now I'm constantly meeting people who have new shows and sometimes their shows stick around. Sometimes they realize how much work this is for very little payoff in the beginning. You know, it takes a few years to really build. I've definitely found it to be welcoming and generally friendly. I've had, you know, little blips here and there. You know, some people really want to, you know, they have goals. They they want to make it in podcasting and they're going to do what it takes to get there. And I'm I'm more kind of a like a vibing person. (laughs) I'm more like, let's go hang out. So other than that, most people have been great. Who specifically has not? (laughs) (laughs) Let's Uh, end your podcasting career right here. Yeah, let's just, (laughs) let's get me canceled right now. I did have a listener at a meetup once show me her list of podcasts she subscribed to and ask me if any of them were like bad people behind the scenes because she had just heard that one of her favorite hosts um, is not very nice on social media and she had no idea and so she wanted me to know, to like tell her and I was like I literally cannot do this <laughs> like not even in the privacy of our conversation can I walk through this list and tell you anything about these people but it, it was kind of funny was her list only John Lorden <laughs> <laughs> I should have told her just stick with John I find most people in the community to be to be great. You know, I think it takes some empathy to do it and to keep doing it. And I think the flashes in the pan are the ones that probably, you know, don't have that lasting energy, I guess. Maybe there's more risk there for for that kind of thing. But, you know, most people we talk to are are awesome. Yeah, same here. Well, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us about, uh, about these cases and about your show. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate um, you guys finally getting down your long, long list of hosts to get to me. (laughs) And we're we're going in alphabetical order and you're C, so you can only imagine. It's been rough. Technically, you you were on one of the first episodes of Crawl Space from that crime con. Yeah, you were talking about Insight back then. Yeah. Yeah, way, way back. I know. (laughs) But yeah, glad to uh, glad to reconnect. Yeah, it was great talking to you. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.